chapter 11 of the Dirt Bike Racer. Fear struck me as I ran toward my bike. I glanced over it, looking for missing parts. They all seemed to be there. I was about to breathe a sigh of relief when I spotted something that told me that we had not interrupted the thief a minute too soon. Two screws were loose on the carburetor. About half of their threads were showing. So that was what he was after, I said out loud. What? said my father, just entering the garage. The carburetor, I said. He had loosened two screws on it. I guess we stopped him just in time. My father came closer and knelt beside the bike with me. Are you sure nothing else was touched here? Let's go. Let's get it on its wheels. We lifted it together. I gave it a thorough check this time and now saw a gap that I'd missed see, uh, seeing the first time. He took the spark plug, I said. If that's all he took, you're lucky. Let's make doubly sure, though. The police will want to know. We both gave the bike a more thorough examination but couldn't find anything else missing. I went to the workbench and was about to pick up a wrench to tighten up the loose screws on the carburetor when I noticed an empty space beside it. Uh-oh, I said. What is it? I glanced over to the workbench looking for a special tool. Did you let anybody borrow those locking grip pliers? I asked. No, I don't think so. Well, they're gone. Oh, grumbled his father. I guess he knew a good thing when he saw it, but he'd better not let anyone see them because your initials are on them. Yes, but what if he grinds them out? That would only make it look more suspicious. A flashing blue light shone through the garage windows. Seconds later, a car stopped out front. Man, they sure get here fast, noticed my father. Let them in, run. I went to the side door and opened it. Two uniformed policemen got out of the cruiser that stopped in front of the driveway. Hi, I said. Hi there, one of them. Are you Baker? Yes, Ron Baker, my father's in here. They entered the garage, introduced themselves as Officer Wilkins and Connolly. Then listened to my father and me explain what we'd heard and seen. The second policeman began taking notes on a pad. Did either of you have a good look at the person? Officer Wilkins asked. We just saw him running across the lawn and leaping over the fence into the next yard, replied my father. I had my flashlight shining on him, but it wasn't strong enough for us to really get a good look at him. Was he short? Tall? Medium, I'd say. That's the best description I can give of him. But he was agile and fast. I'd say he was in his late teens or early twenties. Did you see his face? No. How about you, Ron? I didn't either. I said. He was running away from us and didn't look back once. Okay. Anything else you can add? Anything more than you've already told us? My father mentioned the missing grip pliers and his initials were engraved on them. P.R.B. Why don't you call the lab, Tom? Officer Wilkins said to the colleague. Maybe they'll be able to lift up some prints. Officer Connolly nodded, folded his pad and walked out to the garage. I stood rooted like a statue, listening and watching. This all seemed like a wild dream. I felt I would wake up and find none of this had happened. My father looked at me. Maybe you should go back to bed, Ron, he said. I stared at him. Can't I stay till the men from the lab come, I pleaded. I had seen fingerprints dusted off or on a television, but never in real life. There was something suddenly very exciting about this. OK, said my father. I suppose you've earned it. The lab men, two of them, arrived in about ten minutes. They dusted parts of the mini bike and the window sill, then laid plastic films over the dusted areas, lifted them off carefully and placed them in envelopes. Any good ones, Bob? Officer Wilkins asked one of the men. We lifted one off the mini bike that looks fairly clear, the man called Bob said. I'm afraid that the others are too smudged to help. The lab men left. In the print they got matches up with all those that we have on file. We'll have our man, said Officer Wilkins confidently. He could be the same guy who successfully pulled off a series of similar robberies, robberies during the last six or seven months. Something popped into my mind. It must have shown in my eyes because Officer Wilkins said, What's the matter, Ron? I say something that got you thinking. Well, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I shrugged. I would be guessing, I said, and I might be wrong, real wrong. 
You think you might have an idea who committed the robberies? I didn't know what to say. Look, Officer Wilkins, my father intervened quietly. Why don't you let me talk to my son privately about this? If he knows anything that would help you, I'll let you know. Can we leave it like that? He smiled. Sure, Mr Baker. It's pretty late anyway. We had better get going and let you two go back to bed. Good night. The policeman left. I looked at my father. I wanted to hug him tightly, but all I said was, Thanks, Dad. He smiled and patted me on the shoulder. Come on, let's turn out the lights. We turned them out, turned them, turned them out, locked the doors and went into the house. My mother was in the kitchen waiting for us with anxious eyes. I began to wonder if you two were coming back in or were you going to wait until daylight, she said. Who was that other crew that showed up? My father told her, then nervously, I waited for him to ask me who I thought it was that was committing all the robberies Officer Wilkins and I've mentioned. But he didn't. He just looked at me, smiling faintly. He wasn't pressing me and I was glad. I was getting pretty tired and sleepy anyway. If the thief were either Lugmanil or Skitch Bentley, the fingerprint lab, lab man had lifted would be all the police would need. It wasn't till the next evening, after my father came home from work, that he asked me the question. We might as well get it over with, Ron, he added. It'll be on my mind and your mind too, if we don't. I took a deep breath. I could be wrong, Dad. It's just a guess, like I told Officer Wilkins. OK, well, who are you guessing it could be? Eva Lugmanir or Skitch Bentley. His expression didn't change. You're not surprised, I asked? No, because those guys have crossed my mind too. But, as you said, it's just a guess and guesses don't work. Anyway, both Lug and Skitch have kept their noses clean ever since they got into trouble almost a year ago. I doubt that they would risk their reputations again and a term in jail by committing a series of small robberies. But the robbers are all connected with minibikes and motorcycles, Dad, I reminded him. Somehow, I wasn't altogether convinced that neither Lug or nor Stitch, Skitch was involved. No matter, said my father. Lug and Skitch are innocent until proven otherwise. And you had better remember that. Yes, sir, I said. Are you going to call Officer Wilkins and tell him what I said? No, suspicion isn't enough, Ron. I think it's best that we let the cops handle it. He smiled and patted me on the shoulder. Forget it and start concentrating on that eight-mile cross-country test race. End of chapter 11.